Um, thank you for joining us today for the Gavin Leslie Best Nursing Paper presentation. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we commence. Um, just a note that the ACCCN AGM has moved from this room and will now be held in room E1, which is just up and around the corner. And tonight's um, party will take place at the National Wine Centre from 7.30. Buses will be departing from outside the Convention Centre on North Terrace from 7 p.m. and return trips are from between 9.30 and 11.45 p.m. So with that out of the way, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the recipient of the Gavin Leslie Best Nursing Paper for this year, uh, Dr. Um, Hugh Davies. He's an ACU lecturer at the moment, and he's had a recent transition from clinical to academia, which he's enjoying very much. And for those of you who aren't aware, if this is a, a recent change in the traditional Best Nursing Review paper, which we've had for a number of times. And We've recognised with the increased quality of papers being submitted to Australian Critical Care that it was timely for us to start recognising excellence in research. And, and through a judging process, Hugh's paper was selected for this for this year. Uh, these are papers that are published between the 1st of July of one year and the 30th of June in the following year. And it's to recognise excellence in research by a member of ACCCN. So not surprising that those of you who know Hugh that this is about renal replacement therapy. So with that, I invite Hugh for you to present your paper. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I, um, I, I move around a, a bit, but that's how I like to present. Um, first of all, I'd like to really acknowledge and thank you to the editorial uh, uh, board uh, of the uh, journal. I'm very much appreciative of the award, and I'm sure many of researchers, it can uh, be quite a lonely process, and um, particularly with this study, which involved uh, looking through paper charts, many paper charts, it was a lonely process, and to be uh, recognised in this way is just um, fantastic, and I really appreciate it. So, um, I'd, first of all, I, I would uh, I'd like to go briefly, give a brief overview of the research paper in case you haven't had an opportunity to review the paper. Um, first of all, I'd like to just add that it focuses really on adult critical care. And I'm sure that uh, adult critical care nurses could learn a lot from our paediatric colleagues in terms of fluid management. So first of all, um, the title was a comparison of compliance in the estimation of body fluid status using daily fluid balance charting and body weight changes during continuous renal replacement therapy. The catalyst really um, that really got me interested in doing such a study was really uh, based on three papers. And uh, the um, first one happened to be one of my earlier papers. Um, but, um, and that paper was a retrospective review of fluid balance control in continuous renal replacement therapy. And it looked at dose, but previous studies in the delivery of dose to severe acute kidney injury looked very much at solute clearance, how much dialysis was delivered, and not necessarily uh, removal of fluid, and how much did we achieve what, we, what was prescribed over a 24-hour cycle, the fluid that we said we would remove um, or not. And in that process, again, using paper charts, I found um, that charting of fluid balance um, uh, was sometimes uh, not as accurate as it could be, and also um, the recording of body weights was, in some cases, quite, quite spasmodic and not really uh, uh, consistent. At the same time, two other papers um, were published, uh, the first one was by you, which looked 
and, and found weight change related to fluid volume within the first seven days of an ICU admission was related to worse patient outcomes. And similarly, there was another, around about the same time, another paper published by Schneider that looked at um, fluid balance um, versus weighing patients using a, electronic uh, bed scales. Um, and um, uh, this is uh, where ICUs are fortunate to have purchased what they seem to call smart beds, where they have built-in scales that makes um, a bit easier to weigh your patients rather than the traditional approach uh, of a uh, hoist and lifting the patient up to weigh the patient. So that was really the catalyst of my study. So the objectives were, um, could you rely on nurses to perform frequent daily um, weighing of patients using electronic bed scales? And then as a, as a second aim is to evaluate um, the relationship between a calculated fluid balance and body weight changes in patients receiving continuous renal replacement therapy. So, the methods, it was a pro, prospective cohort interventional observational study. The intervention was a slight change to standard practice, which was at the time um, patients receiving continuous renal replacement therapy um, were weighed second daily. But I wanted to um, do daily uh, weighing of patients. Also, uh, as I found, that there wasn't a set time when uh, a daily um, recording of body weight was recorded and it was spasmodic at different times of the day and didn't correspond to when fluid balance for the whole 24-hour day were totaled. Um, it was conducted in a tertiary ICU between 2015 and February 2016. All patients required continuous renal placement, 18 years old, and admission over 24 hours. They were weighed daily and daily fluid balance charted, and not the ideal time to weigh patients but I chose um, to weigh patients at midnight because it corresponded to, to standard practice of calculating fluid balance to totals um, at midnight. And I thought that was the best way to achieve that paired comparison. Um, fortunately, electronic scales, um, well, they say in the manual, you can weigh the patient while in bed. Um, so it's a lot easier um, and no, uh, no requirement for hoisting or lifting patients. So in terms of patient safety and nursing safety, I thought it was a reasonable um, um, method to follow. Daily differences um, were compared using Pearson correlation and Bland-Altman analysis. And um, I've mentioned insensible um, water losses. Um, this is something that in, in my experience in the ICUs I've worked in WA is not something that's routinely born, uh, routinely accounted for as, a, 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 as, a, a, as an output that is recorded on the fluid balance chart. So that was there just to remind me. Results. Um, just briefly, um, I managed to recruit 61 patients. Um, as you can see from the admission diagnosis, I think it suggests a, a fairly typical sort of population that were, were included in the study of a typical ICU. As you can see, I divided the section into those that survived and those that were non-survivors. And you can see that non-survivors um, had a, uh, 
a medium positive fluid balance and a positive gain in weight. And although not significant, a statistically significant, it did correlate to other more powerful uh, studies that have, have been undertaken that, that have shown a positive fluid balance um, is associated with worse uh, patient outcomes. So, um, a good thing was 98% of patients had a baseline body weight within 24 hours of ICU uh, admission, and I think that's pretty good. Um, and not forgetting that uh, having a body weight is not also important for fluid balance, but also for uh, um, drug administration and nutrition. So I think achieving 98% uh, within 24 hours is pretty good. Out of 403 opportunities to weigh patients, compliance in weighing patients at midnight to be able to compare with a total fluid balance daily chart was 71%. Um, percent. Um, moderate, I would call that moderate compliance. Um, and certainly, if you're going to start relying on body weight measurement to monitor changes in body uh, weight due to fluid volume in the body, then 71%, it needs to be 95%, I suggest, or even higher. Nevertheless, I managed to achieve one measured body weight uh, that was able to be matched with a calculated fluid balance in 39 patients. And this allowed 181 paired comparisons of daily fluid balance total compared to the body weight change. Um, so, so the first statistical um, test I did was a Pearson correlation test. And this was for uncorrected ins insensible water loss. And um, just for some of you, just to re refresh our mem memory, with a correlation uh, scatter plot, um, we're looking for a linear relationship. So if, if Y increases, um, X increases uh, when they're plotted. And I just put in blue a cross S is to show you that we're dealing with negative and positive numbers. And you can see um, um, there is really no suggestion of a po positive correlation or, or a negative correlation. And when I repeated this, when I corrected using a, a, f a standardized a formula that's been but that's been used by other authors to correct for insensible uh, water loss. No real improvement there. As I mentioned, correlation um, just measures um, a linear relationship, but not whether the degree of agreement. Um, and to do that, um, I did a bland Altman plot. Um, for the 101 uh, um, uh, paired examples. Now, um, just if you're not unfamiliar with this statistical uh, test, I'll just run through it with you. Um, a bias um, is referred to the difference between two values of two different methods. So fluid balance is one method and body weight change is the other. So, along the y, um, the y axis, um, it was the, the value of the difference between those two, two uh, measurements were plotted. Then, um, the mean bias is the average of differences of the paired, um, uh, paired sam uh, values when they're averaged out. So, in this example, we've got a mean bias of, well, you can say 180 mils of uh, the difference, or 800, 880 grams. Um, so clinically, over 24 hours, that doesn't sound too bad, does it, really? 
I mean, 180, uh, that's okay. Um, but as you can see, you had wide variances. Um, and where differences were way beyond that, uh, sometimes reaching a litre, um, and maybe not so important as a one-off, but if you think about it when we're doing, when a patient's been in for 10 days and we're doing cumulative fluid balance totals, those one-off um, can have, have consequences uh, over gradual days and increasingly the fluid balance chart becomes um, increasingly inaccurate. So, I think the, the, the study um, opened up quite a lot of uh, discussion and debate. Um, and um, this is what I'd like to do now, is to look at some definitions that are out there in the literature. Um, just a brief overview of body fluid compartments, um, um, the um, ways to estimate body um, fluid status, invasive as well as non-invasive methods, look at um, fluid management or the typical fluid management strategies that are used, briefly explain the pathophysiology of fluid overload and, and its significance uh, for patient outcomes, um, the challenges of, of maintaining a fluid balance chart and challenges of, of measuring body weight. So we'll look at some definitions. So um, daily fluid balance. I'm sure any new uh, graduate nurse that, it, that will tell you that it's input, total input for the day minus total output uh, for the day. So that's pretty simple. Um, cumulative fluid balance with, re refers to the sum of fluid balances um, uh, on consecutive days. Um, throughout the stay of the patient. The term positive fluid balance really refers to a balance that's obviously positive, but no obvious signs and symptoms of, of fluid overload, um, whereas um, the term fluid overload is often associated with signs and symptoms uh, um, or evidence of fluid overload, such as uh, a chest x-ray or on physical examination of the patient. Percentage of fluid overload adjusted for body weight. So that's really um, the cumulative uh, fluid balance uh, divided by the uh, admission body weight times 100. Uh, that gives you a percentage of um, weight gain related to f fluid volume. Then we've got the cumulative body weight change, which is a sum of changes in body weight throughout um, the patient's admission. And again, a reminder, we're basing the assumption of one mil equals one gram. So just a brief overview of uh, body fluid compartments. Uh, we're made up of about 60% of uh, water. That equates to about 45 litres. And um, in this diagram, it's neatly divided into, into two, basically two compartments, extracellular and intracellular. And extracellular is divided into vascular and interstitial compartments. But this all sort of um, um, goes... Hey, what? Well, um, in the critically ill patient, as you know, um, the fluid compartments don't stay in a nice cylindrical uh, diagram as this. And with management of the patient, uh, each compartment, uh, its significant changes, um, um, depending on, on who you're treating. So with your uh, interstitial compartment, uh, that's really more significant in your ARDS patient where you've got uh, fluid um, that's in this interstitium um, that's uh, uh, 
that's the major issue, whereas in, in sepsis, you, the vascular compartment is the one uh, that is of, um, uh, of more significance. And how um, all these sort of fluid compartments uh, play in the total, the distribution of the total body water um, is, is quite unclear uh, um, and not like uh, as depicted uh, here. So, um, how do we um, uh, estimate body fluid uh, status? And as I mentioned, um, it can be non-invasive uh, as well as invasive. So the first port of call is a physical examination, and that's important, but that can be variable depending on uh, the technique that is used. Certainly hemodynamic uh, pr parameters are helpful, heart rate, blood pressure, mental status, that can give an indication. Filling pressures, um, that can also help, but remember it's pressure, pressures being measured rather than volume, and there's little strong evidence to show that pressures do sort of tell you on the hydration of, of a patient. There's obviously uh, hemodynamic monitoring, um, but that obviously is very invasive. You've got uh, radiological uh, techniques, um, such as your uh, regular morning chest X-ray. Um, I've included um, these two, bioelectric impedance tomography and tritanium indicator dilution. I've um, never seen these two in clinical practice. They're out there in the literature, they're talked about, but in terms of uh, relevance in the clinical uh, uh, practice right now, um, I have to say, not relevant. But right now, what is relevant is um, the daily uh, charting of fluid balance and body weight measurements. They're the two most common non-invasive methods that we uh, use um, to estimate body fluid status in the critically ill patient. So, um, fluid management. So, I'm just going to talk to you how a typical sort of ICU patient comes into the unit and um, um, so um, the first phase really is resuscitation. So if we've got a hypovolemic patient due to bleeding, uh, we need to give fluids. Um, we might have a septic patient and we need to uh, give fluids so that we're able to stabilize that patient. Okay. Once we've stabilized that patient, we come through to the maintenance phase. And the maintenance phase is uh, the opportunity. We've stabilized the patient, and now we're, we're doing all the treatments to, to correct the underlying uh, cause of disease, such as, uh, for example, in sepsis, uh, we'll start the antibiotics, etc. cetera. Um, so once we've got the uh, maintenance, once we've established they're stable, the maintenance phase, and we're trying to reestablish normal fluid balance. But that may not be possible, and we may have to go on to the third stage where we have to think about fluid restriction and removal such as diuretics um, and um, dialysis. Okay, so this looks very uh, nice and orderly and sequential, but as you know, in real, uh, out in real clinical practice, this doesn't, this rarely happens so that you maybe got to the maintenance uh, um, phase, and before you get to the removal phase, you're back down to the resuscitation phase. Uh, and I'm trying to get across that through the uh, course of a, a patient's admission over uh, 10, 15 days, you can see how the cumulative fluid balance can get really quite tricky to track where this fluid and, uh, 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 and the documentation of, of, of estimating how much they've actually uh, had in a, uh, a fluid balance chart. Remembering that during this uh, phase, um, they may have been down to, uh, gone to theater a couple of times, or they may have gone down to um, 
a scan and some fluid may have been given that hasn't been documented or, or uh, recorded. So that's where fluid management uh, becomes uh, tricky. So the pathogenic mechanism of fluid overload. So if we're dealing with um, a patient that's susceptible uh, for uh, kidney injury, um, the, the resuscitation um, fluid that's commonly given is um, normal saline that, as you know, has quite a high sodium contrate. And we may already have a kidney that's failing to, to uh, remove sodium, uh, and we, we, may we may exacerbate the sodium retention, and also in the saline is, is uh, uh, chloride that is also has been shown to be harmful to the kidneys. Um, as the kidney is a capsular encapsulated organ, and um, that uh, uh, interstitial edema places pressure on the uh, uh, organ and so that that internal pressure causes reduced uh, blood flow. And not only the kidneys affected, but other organs are also affected, um, such as the lungs and, and liver. And lots of studies are coming through now. These are fairly old now, but there's more and more coming online, showing particularly in acute kidney, um, injury patients, fluid overloaded, uh, uh, reduces morbidity um, and increases uh, mort uh, mortality. Um, we know that uh, a positive fluid balance um, is associated with uh, less opportunities for weaning and extubation failure. Delays recovery of acute kidney injury and um, poor outcomes. It's interesting to note that all these studies, and many studies still continue when I've gone through the literature, they all talk about fluid uh, overload, and they're all based on the fluid balance chart, but none of them really report, well, how accurate are they? You know, no, um, I think I've just seen one paper where they talked about discrepancies, factoring a discrepancy in uh, the charting of fluid balance, but they're all basing their assumptions um, on a, um, a chart, not telling how the chart was recorded and um, what the error rate was. So I'm gonna talk about a uh, fluid, uh, fluid balance chart and the advantages, because there's gotta be some advantages. Well, it's it's certainly a routine nursing practice, practice. That's what we learn the, 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 the day when we start on the wards. It's cheap. It does not require technology. It's certainly intuitive and simple. You know, you need to record what goes in and record what goes out. Um, it's easily performed. Um, I think this is interesting, though. Um, qualitative data. It certainly does. It, it, you want to know what's the what the type of fluid you're giving and what type of fluid you're losing. So, uh, as well as quantitative measurements, qualitative is very important. Um, it certainly does provide a continuous daily monitoring and a, a, a trend of a fluid balance and does provide um, an estimated indication of a possible positive uh, fluid accumulation. So I just put this in because I thought this was interesting. I think fluid balance charting is, is nursing culture, and um, this is a, a modern practical nursing procedures that was published in, um, in the 1950s, and it specifically mentions the responsibility of the nursing to maintain a fluid balance chart. And uh, if anyone's interested, it's on eBay um, for $40 if you need a copy. <laughs> and uh, I think there's a copy in the, um, in the state, uh, South Australian State Library. 
also disadvantages. I think everyone knows in the room it's subject to errors. And it's, I feel no criticism of nursing uh, staff because it is quite difficult if you've got a complex uh, patient that's come from theatre with all sort of infusions, uh, needing uh, liquid nutrition. It's quite hard to track what's going in and what's coming out. Um, so it's not surprising that errors do uh, happen. And not only with um, uh, paper-based, uh, paper but um, electronic. Um, electronic still requires manual inputting of outputs. Um, so that's interesting to, to remember. And based on presentations yesterday, I think we're still going to be, in many ICUs, still be uh, stuck with paper-based charting um, for the next 10, 10 years. Remember, it only records what is charted, so if, some, uh, if something's missed, then it's, it's, it's not recorded, it doesn't exist. Certainly is subject to calculation errors, and um, these are three uh, recent studies that have shown that calculation errors do occur and wide uh, variances occur. And as far back as uh, 1979, in the Heart and Lung Journal, another paper uh, mentioned about inaccuracies in fluid. Uh, so it's nothing new. Um, the issue of non-recordable losses. How do you record evapor how do you record evaporative loss? Um, it has to be a calculated or a formulated uh, uh, figure. Uh, and in my study, I, u I use uh, 10 mils per kilogram. And um, if a patient was pyrexic, um, various uh, formulas suggest adding 500 mils uh, to make a round total, so to speak. Um, and then, because of all these issues, I suggest that there may be a breed of complacency that creeps in if a patient has been with you for 15, 20 days and you're looking at the cumulative fluid balance and you're thinking, of all these issues, is that really, is it worth, you know, what is it really telling me? So, the alternative is, um, uh, is, is, is weighing your patient. And for some clinicians, uh, uh, it's a gold standard. And I know many intensivists try and try and instill in their units, uh, let's get weighing up to uh, uh, regular weighing regimes. But for some reason, many factors uh, uh, come into play and uh, regular weighing sometimes gets missed and difficult to enforce at times. I'll put this in again to remember that we're assuming one kilogram equals one litre change in body fluid weight. Um, and we know that body weight in the first week certainly is influenced by uh, fluid volume. Um, um, but later on down the track, uh, if we've got a patient that's been in the ICU for 20 days, um, then other factors could explain uh, changes in weight. And then I've repeated again, Hughes study that did show that body weight alone can be used um, as a way of um, uh, indicating um, um, the survival uh, um, as a way of measuring outcomes, was a factor in outcomes. So disadvantages, certainly if you have to use hoist and weigh, it's not without its risks, uh, both to patient and nursing and other uh, allied uh, uh, staff. Um, so um, not surprising, sometimes if you're left with uh, hoist and waste, a uh, uh, weighing uh, that you, you, know, you, you think twice before you do it on certain patients. Um, weigh capable beds. Um, the smart beds are certainly uh, a, a good option, but they're expensive. 
and not all ICUs can afford them. Um, if using uh, those types of beds, then um, it does really need standardization of procedures to improve accuracy. And this was well documented in his study, Schneider's study, um, how difficult it is to get a standard process of weighing patients. And his first study in 2012 was in a large general ICU where um, workflows and, and, um, and movement of staff was quite, uh, the turnover was quite quick. Um, he, he repeated the study in a less sort of um, more controlled environment uh, involving cardiothoracic patients. And even then, to get that culture of weighing patients um, and consistency in protocols and procedures was difficult. Um, it's important to, when you're going to weigh the patient and have consistency so you do get a con you do get consistent, consensual, um, consecutive um, body weight measurements so that you can see a trend in the, in, in the uh, uh, change in, in body weight. And it certainly requires training and reminders to become part of standard care. Um, some suggest it, it may take months, but some it might take a year or two to really get the practice. And that's where the, tran the translation of what we know into practice is difficult. So I'd um, like to conclude and make some um, points or observations. So few studies have really evaluated the benefits of maintaining um, a fluid balance chart. If we're going to assume that we need to try and get the fluid balance chart as accurate as we can, it is time consuming, it has some pay, uh, risk for the nurses in, in dealing with body fluids and things, so if we're insisting that we need to get a good fluid balance chart and to be as accurate as we can, then we need to know the benefits. Is it going to be useful? Is it going to be useful in medical decision making? And few studies have really looked at that. Fluid overload can impede recovery and worse, um, increased mortal mortality. So fluid balance charting has increased in significant, I would argue, because of the association of worse outcomes with fluid overload. Um, so um, possibly in past years, uh, people have known that fluid balance charts are not that accurate. But now that we know that, that patients who, have, who are fluid overloaded that are, 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 have worse outcomes, then we need to think about how we do fluid balance charting. Obviously, we need to exercise caution with making clinical decisions based solely on daily and cumulative fluid balance calculations. Weight-based measurements um, can, be, uh, can improve, I would argue, estimation of body fluid status because it's a physiological representation of total body water. So you get an overview of how much body uh, uh, flu fluid is being carried by the, by the patient. Um, obviously, additional physical and other assessments uh, need to be also factored in and considered and evaluated. Um, we've looked at non-invasive um, alternatives, but until they come in and are, are used regularly, um, I think the evaluation of them is still experimental, I would suggest. So the question is that... Um, um, Body weight um, may be a more accurate way if we can get a way of estimating uh, body fluid st status, if we can get uh, a regular, consistent, consecutive uh, measurements. And if we're able to achieve that and build that culture into a unit, could we ever consider an RCT where we have fluid balance versus body weight? 
So what's next in my research uh, endeavors? Um, so um, systematic uh, review, it's been a, a long and torrid process, <laughs> but uh, the protocol's out there, um, some setbacks, but it's, it's on its way. I've, uh, what's, I found difficult is, as I mentioned earlier, not many studies have really dealt with the practicalities of fluid balance charting, what they did and what they didn't do, how they totaled, et cetera, and what was the discrepancy when checked, et cetera. And the same with how um, uh, researchers uh, weighed patients. Like, so there's little out there, so it has been challenging. Also, there's, I have future plans to investigate the usefulness of maintaining a fluid balance. And some of my ideas may be very controversial, and I'll have to uh, build relationships with clinical, with the intensivists, uh, as well as uh, nurses by the bedside. But it would be interesting if one could uh, do a study where there was no daily fluid balances and medical decision making was based on body weight and physical assessments. You would still document inputs and outputs, but you would hide the sum, the daily sum at the end of the day. You would compare this where no body weight was done, but fluid balance uh, totals and uh, physical assessment was completed and compared. Then you would have only clinical assessment only and you, you would have no um, body weight or, or fluid balance to look at. Um, that would be challenging to do, um, and I th you would have the information available, but in terms of um, um, allowing the doctors to see this information would be allowed only on request, and then the reasons uh, documented why they needed that information other than, for example, only clinical assessment. But these were some of my ideas to further evaluate the usefulness of uh, fluid balance charting. So, any questions? Thanks very much, Hugh. I uh, welcome any questions from the audience. If you could come to one of the microphones, there's one down here and another one sort of halfway up the other aisle. Just while we're waiting for people to make their way there, Hugh, a, a couple of things that um, I was thinking about as you were talking, and, and one is around technology and you know beds being able to weigh patients, and you talked about protocols and procedures, and and I'm you know, was, was part of that the consistent zeroing of the bed before a patient is admitted? Yes. And then, but what about calibration, you know, over time? Because sometimes these beds get into units and they stay there for quite a long time. Are they ever, you know, what's, is there anything out there on what the practice is or is that an area that we need to look at? Yes, well, the manufacturers do uh, suggest and recommend regular um, uh, calibration, and that's usually followed by the biophysics department that's calibrated. Um, there are special procedures in that before the patient is, is admitted and placed onto the bed, they need to be, uh, uh, the bed needs to be tarred um, or zeroed before the patient is, is placed on, on the bed. Um, and um, um, standardization of what equipment is attached to the, to the bed when the bed is uh, tarred so that there's consistency so when the patient is weighed um, that it's, it's been zeroed with the equipment that's been attached. The problem is, is that often um, you lose track of what has been added and what has been taken away. So it does become uh, quite problematic and not simply just pushing a button and you get a weight. Sorry, can we just, we'll go to the person at the microphone. If you could make your way either to this one or that one up there, please. Yeah. Hi, um, I found that very interesting. Thank you. Um, I'm Fran. I'm one of the educators at Royal Melbourne Intensive Care. Uh, one of my pet hates is when I go around and see students and I say to them, tell me about your patient's fluid balance. And they pick up the chart and go, oh, they're positive three litres. I say to them, what does that mean? 
So that distinction for me about where fluid sits is really important with the chart that you showed. So I just wondered, in your research, have you thought about how you might be able to incorporate some good clinical assessment skills among, amongst nurses? So it's not just this number that says there's fluid, but it tells us a bit about where that fluid is and the significance of that. Yes, uh, thank you for the point. Uh, in actual study, um, I have uh, I, that wasn't part of, of, of the actual study about physically looking at the plate and evidence of, um, but you, you, you're right, that is something that, um, that needs to be also investigated in improving that physical assessment because it should be combine, combined um, with the fluid balance chart. Yes, my question is very close to yours. Uh, I just wonder, in your study about the, the electronic bed uh, scale to with the patient, what's the uh, uh, precision of those measurements uh, from the bed, the accuracy of it? Like yeah. some digital scales that sometimes you get from supermarket, anything less than 500 gram, it won't register anything. Yep. Um, um, as, as Andrew mentioned, that calibration is very important and, and that's a regular feature that needs to be carried out. Um, there was in the study uh, an erroneous measurement where um, a, a body weight change of, I think, 19.5 um, kilogram, you know, and, and that couldn't be uh, explained uh, uh, physiologically. Um, so there are issues with measuring our, our patients and getting the, the um, accurate measurement. And part of the study did involve double checking so that uh, at midnight it were, the patient was weighed and then an hour later that weight was reconfirmed by a second checker who checked, who did the same, um, who followed the standard process of weighing the patient. So I tried to minimise that error rate. But you're right, it, it does occur. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ros Elliott from Royal North Shore. This is a um, more of a practical question, Hugh. Do you know what's the best way of estimating losses that end up in the bed? This is always a bit of a conundrum for me, particularly if someone's got diarrhea or you know, maybe I don't know bile from a drain or something like that. Do you do you have any um, sort of are there any sort of training materials on how we might estimate that more accurately? Well, other than using scales and based on the formula of, you know, weighing the dry dressing and then seeing what the weight is after it's been, uh, um, you know, soiled or whatever, and, and then using the formula of one uh, um, mil equals one gram, um, um, that's usually... The, but that really explains the issue of the, the problems with fluid balance charting and how... Um, inaccuracies occur along the, the patient's journey throughout ICU. Um, so, yeah, that's one of the issues. Vanilla? Um, thank you, Hugh. I'm Vanilla Gill from, from Perth. Thank you very much, Hugh. Great presentation and, and of course, really good paper. Um, I, I was interested for your comments about the impact of, of your work on the unit that you collected the data when you've reported the findings. Has that had any um, has there been any change to practice, or has has um, has, has there been any um, any response from from the right. unit? Um, during the actual study itself, certainly it created interest um, in um, uh, because it was such a nursing responsibility of fluid balance charting, and it, it, it created a lot of discussion. Um, but certainly, um, it's very hard. Um, you know, when you're moving out of um, the clinical, regular exposure to clinical area and to make sure what you've put forward is translated into regular practice. Um, so um, I can say that perhaps some of those issues have um, reduced their significance now that my presence is not full time. But having said that, I intend to keep that clinical uh, presence there and focus on the importance of, of, of fluid balance and regular weighing patients. Thank you. Yes. Hello, sorry. Um, Becky from uh, Flinders Medical Centre here in Adelaide. Um, just wondering a quick question, and obviously doing daily weighs gives us a good 
trend um, in 24-hour change of weight. Um, but other variables to take into account, especially in our longer-term patients, such as muscle mass loss, um, which is something obviously is very difficult to measure, um, and also being able to tell where this fluid is, you know, patients that are sick are third spacing their fluid or, um, yeah, just... Yes, you're quite right. Um, um, you, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, really um, after sort of like a, a over a week to two weeks, uh, that muscle wasting and uh, a, an effect of that long-term patient, um, then fluid as a, as a way of judging weight gain is, 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 or loss is, is um, you know, is influenced by muscle wasting. So you, you are correct, and that's the issue. But the average length of stay um, of an ICU patient um, reported to be four or five days. Um, and um, for, for renal patients, it's a bit longer. Um, so, uh, you know, as a sort of general rule, one can apply uh, weight, uh, 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 changes in body weight due to fluid uh, gain or loss um, for the majority of patients. But you're quite right, if you have that long-term patient, then muscle wasting is a factor. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting topic. Thank Thanks. you. Yep. Tom? Uh, Hugh, Tom Buckley from Sydney. Uh, congratulations on your award. Um, I'm just interested in your comment on the one mil per gram formula because mm. all fluids in and all fluids out would not necessarily have the same viscosity. So. That, that's right. Um, and that's what I mentioned about um, assessing the, um, the um, um, qualitative aspect of, um, uh, of, of what f uh, fluid you're giving. Um, obviously, um, the fluid that you're giving intravascularly is very different to the liquid nutrition that you give um, via the gut, and the same um, with uh, urine output um, uh, uh, and output from drains, etc. Um, so, yes, um, I suppose in looking at the usefulness um, of fluid balance diet, perhaps it's the qualitative rather than the quantitative aspect of fluid balance charting is possibly more significant in its usefulness um, because of the issues, as people have mentioned, about accuracy in, in quantifying uh, fluid input and output. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'm Elisa from Royal Melbourne as well. We were wondering, um, if you found that there was uh, any discrepancy in accuracy from documentation from a paper-based um, documentation as opposed to the electronic? Um, yeah, a good point. It, uh, my study was just all on paper-based, okay. but I have worked in uh, units where electronic uh, spreadsheet or clinical information systems are used. And yes, I mean, it's calculated for you. The inputs and outputs Whatever you put in, it's calculated uh, as per um, uh, 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 as a spreadsheet. So its accuracy is the accuracy of the computer. So yes, um, the issue is it still relies on um, ent manual entry for outputs. So there's still um, uh, an issue of accuracy in entering data using a clinical information system, but in terms of calculating arithmetical uh, formulas, then yes, uh, it's accurate. Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Hugh. Um, I think there's an excellent presentation and a, a great way to illustrate some of the excellent research studies that are getting published in Australian critical care. And I just want to say a special thanks to Dr. Fenella Gill, who leads this portfolio as one of the editors of the journal, because it's a big task to try and corral the editorial board members and come up with a decision. But my understanding that this time around, the decision was absolutely unanimous, that yours was the best paper published in that time. So congratulations. Thank you. I would like to first of all just acknowledge um, support that I've had 
from the government of WA, um, Health Department, uh, Foundation for Nursing Research from Royal Perth Hospital and the Reigning Medical Foundation, who I was fortunate to have received a, a grant for my uh, research. Also, I'd like to acknowledge um, Professor Gavin Leslie, um, who has uh, been a mentor for me in my um, interest in research, and also uh, Dr. David Morgan, who's an intensivist at um, Fiona Stanley Hospital. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder that the ACCN AGM is in room E1, um, starting in about five minutes. <laughs>